If you spend as much time on social media as I do, and perhaps even if you don't, then you remember a couple of months back when Robin Williams died that there was this tremendous outpouring of grief, of mourning. People across the internet who had never met the man telling their stories of what he meant to them, telling their loss, telling their sorrow and their outrage that someone so gifted and so loved would take his own life. And people really came together in this sense of loss. It was a totally appropriate and beautiful reaction to the loss of a wonderful man. But in the middle of it, I saw that a friend of mine posted a little graphic which mentioned the extinction of the western black rhino. Now I looked it up later, it turns out that the western black rhino was officially declared extinct in the wilds in November of 2013, but in the moment it struck me that there was so much grief, so much mourning, so much expression of loss in the public sphere for this one man and yet an entire species was gone. Not just any species, something as grand, as famous, as notable as a rhinoceros. And there was no public mourning. Just a little out of date notice not people coming together to tell their stories of when they were little kids, how they played with rhinoceros toys. There was no place. And it made me really realize how little space there is for us to mourn, for us to hold our grief over the terrible ecological devastation that all of us are witness to. We're witness in the small ways, like my parched lawn, which has fallen victim to our drought here in California. And we mourn in large ways for the knowledge of what climate change is likely to do, not only to our children's generation, but to our own. And it's so hard to know what to do with that grief. This summer, as we often do, my family went up to Washington State. My partner grew up on a marina outside of Olympia, and we went to see the beautiful location, to take a ride in a canoe. And when we'd been there a couple of years earlier, the pilings that hold up the marina were all covered in these beautiful purple or orange starfish. And this year, there were none. Zero, not a starfish in sight. And it turns out that the starfish of the Northwest have basically been wiped out by a disease which is directly related to the warmer water temperatures. Gone. And where do you go to mourn the loss of starfish? How do you hold that? Sometimes the grief really to me feels overwhelming. The prospect of what needs to happen and what isn't happening, what we need to do and how little it is that I can actually do to affect change. It just makes me want to curl up in a corner and draw the covers up over my head and say, I can't do it. It's too much, I give up. I will do my little piece, I'll save energy, I'll cut down on driving, I'll save water, I'll change the light bulbs. I've already changed the light bulbs. How much difference can that really make? And it's easy to land in that place of despair and just want to give up. But here's what I realized. Giving up is not an option. 
And I don't just mean that in a moralistic, we must do what we can, everything that we do now makes so much more difference than what we do later. We must care for the precious lives of those around us and our children. All that's true. It's absolutely true. But it is also literally absolutely true. There is not an option of giving up because there is not another planet. There's no other place to move to so as to avoid dealing with what's happening to this one. You can't give up because you can't leave. The only choice you get is how you're going to live on this planet that we have, this planet that we know is changing. The choice you get is how you prepare for the changes. And I know that there are plenty of people out there who are preparing in a way that I identify as preparing for the zombie apocalypse. As far as I can tell, you prepare for the zombie apocalypse by hoarding food, by getting shotguns, by building bunkers, by trying to protect what's yours from the threat outside. And I suppose there are scenarios in which that would help for a while. But here's the thing about the zombie apocalypse model. Once you have started preparing for the future as the onslaught of zombies, the zombies have already won. You have already turned yourself into a zombie in battening down the hatches and protecting yourself from those around you, from trying to shut out the world, you've already turned yourself into a body walking around without a soul. The zombies have already won. So what's the alternative? As far as I can tell, the alternative is to prepare yourself as if you were going to a different country. A different country where the food is different, where the transportation is different, where the style of living is different. And to accept that you are moving into a world where perhaps people can only get by by caring for one another. Where people can only get by by sharing what it is they have and by sharing what it is that they know, where people can only get by by being in connection with their neighbors, in learning to make music together, in learning to dance together, in learning to be a community here, where we are. This country, whatever country that might be, that might not look like the world of opulence, the world of things that so many of us live in, but which could nonetheless be a beautiful place, could nonetheless be a place where you want to live because you have built it that way, because you've envisioned the world which is possible and you've reached out to people not to hang on to what isn't going to be there, but to build what can be. And in that world, I think we can mourn together. I think that we can hold hands and tell stories. Do you remember this giant armor-plated beast? Do you remember that multi-armed, bumpy-skinned being that lived in the water. Do you remember? And together we could mourn our losses. And together we could start building not the world that we have, but the world that we want.